Paper.js is the Swiss army knife of vector graphic scripting. There's a lot of cool examples to check out, like this tadpoles example where these tadpoles, I guess they are, swim around your screen. And what was the other one I really liked? Really liked this metaballs where you can drag around, you get this nice gooey effect. Anyways, I'm gonna show you how to get Paper.js set up in your Webflow project and generating cool things like maze kind of structure and we'll click this button and it'll regenerate the maze. Say I wanna do some dots, like a kind of a Jackson Pollock thing. Then we got this. I'm gonna show you how to make the canvas responsive and scale with browser window or not, whatever you wanna do. So stay tuned and let's get started. Hey there, Web Bay. Here we are in Webflow. I have this div called wrap and this is just a flex with a line and justify set to center. It's got a min height of 100 viewport heights, overflow hidden and position relative. Inside that I have title wrap, which is an absolutely positioned div that's holding our title and our button. This button, if you'll notice, has an ID of regen button. We're gonna use this to regenerate our canvas on click. And then I have a custom code embed. And here I've got a width of 100%, min height of 100 viewport heights. I don't need the sizing, not sure why that's there. And inside of that custom code embed, we have a canvas element. So just opening a canvas tag here, I give it this resize attribute, giving it a class of paper canvas and an ID of paper canvas. And then we go ahead and close our tag there. So I'll save and close that. This HTML here is where we define the styles for our class paper canvas. So I'm giving it a height of 100 viewport heights and a width of 100 viewport widths and pointer events none. Basically, I want this thing to take up our whole hero section and I don't want the user to be able to click on it because I want them to be able to click on the button and those sorts of things. I don't want the canvas to be on top of any of our interactive elements. Lastly, in page settings, if I click the icon here and scroll down, I'm importing the CDN first. Notice this defer tag that I have here, and that is being pulled in from this CDN repository. So I'm using version 0.12.17. And then I'm importing a code sandbox file here. To start, let's just make sure that we can draw a circle on the screen. So we wanna get our canvas set up, and we wanna make sure that we're able to access the paper object from paper.js. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna declare a variable called canvas, and I'm gonna use document.querySelector method targeting that ID of paper canvas that we set on the canvas within our HTML embed. Then I'm gonna call paper.setup and I'm gonna pass our canvas element to that. This is so that paper knows about what canvas it should draw on. Next, I'm gonna define a variable called point and we're gonna use this new keyword and we're gonna call that on paper.point and these are the X and Y coordinates for point. How do I know that? Because if I come over to the documentation on paper.js, if I click on reference here, and then I click on path. Path.circle takes a center and a radius, and if you click, you get even more there. So the center and the radius are defined by a point object, and then the, sorry, the, set, the x and the y are defined by a point object, and the radius is defined by this number here. So now we can declare our circle variable and pass new paper.path.circle, and the first argument to that will be point, which again takes that x and y value of 400 and 400, which we're just hard coding here, and then a radius, which I'll set to 300. So next I'm gonna change the circle's fill color by instantiating a new color instance. And to do that, I call the keyword new paper.color, and then we need to pass RGB values. Paper.js is expecting these values as percentages. So if I come back to the documentation here and I click color under styling section, we can see that color takes one color has an RGB constructor and it expects RGB between zero and one, the green between zero and one and blue between zero and one. It also has an optional parameter for alpha if you wanna set some transparency. It does have support for HSL and all those wonderful things. And then lastly, you can also just pass a string with a hex code in it. So I'm just showing you right here that we can use our percentages. A website I found useful was this convertingcolors.com giving it a normal RGB between zero and 255, you can get the RGB percents down here. So if I save this and refresh, we now get a blue circle on our screen. There's not much particularly interesting about a blue circle on our screen, so let's make something a little bit more fun. I'm gonna call paper.project.clear, which is a method that we can just use to get rid of that blue circle. We could also just delete the code, but I wanted to show you this clear method. And then let's get the width and height of our canvas. We'll store that in a variable w and in a variable h. Next, we'll define a variable called distance and I'll just hard code this to the value of 20 for the time being. 
Now we're going to create a nested for loop. Nested for loops are great anytime you want to do something that's going to be a grid shape or like a matrix. So we call this a two dimensional array. And I'm going to loop from a value of x equal to zero to x less than the width of our canvas. And then we're going to increment by our distance amount each time. Inside of that, I'm going to have another for loop, and I'm just going to do the same, but this time I'm going to use y as my variable, and I am going to do it less than the height of the canvas. And then inside this, I wanted to make a circle for each iteration of our loop. So something I can do, I've already written a lot of this code, I'll just take this point variable and call it again down here, and instead of 400, 400, I'm just going to pass x and y, which we're getting from this loop, and then I'll use that point to create a circle, and I just copy and paste that down here. And instead of a radius of 300, I want to use a radius of, let's say, what is it? Distance divide by two. And let's set the fill color on our circle so that we can see it. Paste that, save, I come back. Now I can see I have this cool grid and within the grid I have all these circles that are showing up. And you can see the very first circle starts with the center at zero, zero. And then this would be, the second circle would be what is this uh, distance? So this is 20 pixels and then 20 pixels and then 20 pixels. And we're just iterating through that and generating all of these circles. Now I think distance divided by two is a little bit much. So if I say something like distance divided by four, then there'll be a little bit more breathing room between all of these circles. So that's kind of starting to look more interesting, I think. And then the fact that they're all the same color is a bit boring. So let's deal with that next. At the top, I'm going to go ahead and define a variable called colors here, and it's just going to be an array of hex codes for colors. And then I'm also going to make a helper function. Down here at the bottom of the code, I'll define a function called getRandomIndex, and this takes a variable called max. This is just going to be like the maximum number, so if I want a, a number between 0 and 5, then I'll pass the number of 5 in here, and we'll return math.floor of math.random times that max number. So math.random gives us a random number between 0 and 1, we multiply that by our maximum, which will give us a random number between zero and five. However, this will have a bunch of decimals. So we wanna call math.floor on that to remove any of the decimals. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this get random index function to access a random color within our colors array. And so rather than calling circle.fillcolor here, new paper.color, let's say let color equal, do I already define color somewhere? Nope, we're good, so I'll let color equal colors of get random index and in that I want to pass colors dot length so if I save now and then I'm setting circle dot fill color equal to new paper dot color and let's pass our new value of color to that so I save come back to our code and refresh and now I get circles that are all a bunch of different colors and each time I refresh the page the colors are showing up in different places. So this is kind of the basics of generative art. Rather than refresh the page, if I want the user to be able to click this regenerate button, then we can code that up pretty simply. When I'm selecting my canvas here, I'll also select the regen button, and I'll say that's equal to document.query selector, and I'll pass the ID of what, I think I called it regen button like this. And now we just need an event listener so that we can do something when we click this button. So I'll call a regen button, and I'll add an event listener to that. The event I want to listen for is the click event, and it has to know of a function to run once I click it. Uh, I haven't defined it yet, but let's call this function something like handle regen button clicked. And now I'll just copy this and define it. So we're saying function handle regen button clicked, open close parentheses, open close brackets, and what I want to do is I want to run this code whenever that button is clicked. So I could copy and paste this code down in here, but I don't want to repeat myself. So let's define another function. We'll call it main, open close parentheses, open close brackets, hit enter, select all this junk and move it up into there. Now, whenever we call our main function, all of this code will run. So let's go ahead within handle regen button clicked, call that function main. And then also notice we're never actually running this code if when the page loads, so at the bottom of main, let's just call it so that it runs itself. And if we come back and refresh, we have a new regenerated art and we can click our regenerate button and get new dots on the screen. Something you might notice if I zoom in really close here is there's this weird kind of artifacting on the outside of the circle. And what's going on here is we're not clearing our, we're not clearing our canvas every time we run this code. So we have like kind of artifacting of colors on top of colors. 
if I just come in here and say paper.project.clear and save and refresh, now each time I regenerate, I'm not seeing any of that artifacting because we're clearing our canvas and we're getting something fresh and new. So that's something to look out for. Things are looking good on full screen, but if I shrink the window and refresh, and then I start enlarging again, you'll notice our generative art has not generated into the part of the screen that did not exist just a couple seconds ago. We can leverage the window resize event to fix this. You notice if I refresh now, everything's fine, but let's go ahead, I'm gonna come in here and I'm actually gonna make our distance variable here dependent on width. So let's make it something like W divide by 50 and I'll save that. And if I refresh, you'll just notice that these are a little bit bigger, but we're still gonna have our same problem with this here. So let's come back down here and where we're doing our event listeners, I'll call window dot, I think it's called on resize. Yeah, so I'll call window dot on resize equals handle resize. Now again, we're gonna have to define this function. So function handle resize, open close parentheses, open close brackets. And within that, I just wanna run main again. So main, open close parentheses, save, and it'll add a semicolon for us and refresh. Let's see how things are scaling. So it's just rerunning the draw every time. And if I come here, refresh, it's gonna paint everything. And then I come out, oh, it's still broken. And that is because I need to just put all of this within that main function. So if I cut this, and then after paper.project.clear, I'll define all this stuff again, save and come back here. And now, notice how it's scaling as we resize our window, even like that. Dots are cool, but what if we wanted to draw something like lines instead? I'm just gonna go ahead and save all of our wonderful work with dots here. I'm gonna copy and paste this code down into a function called dots. And it needs X and Y and distance, so let's pass those as parameters, just like that. And if we ever wanted to call this again, back in our for loop, we can just say dots of X, Y distance and save and then refresh and everything will still be working right as we had made it. It can be a little bit annoying to be writing paper.point, paper.path, paper.color all over the place. So something we can do is up at the top here to find, we'll destructure these values off of paper. So what do we want? We want path, we want color, and we want line, and we want circle. And I just set that equal to the paper object. And now what I can do is, I'm gonna leave it on these two because I haven't destructured those. But right here, and I'm just hitting Control D, Control D, I can delete those and save and check everything is still working, and check everything is still working, save, refresh, still not working. Oh, I didn't get point, I also need to get point, save, refresh, and there we go. So dots can be fun, but you know what else is fun? Drawing lines. So we're gonna use lines to draw a grid, and to do that I will call a function down here. Let's call this uh, function grid, and this is gonna need an X, a Y, and a distance. Now I wanna instantiate a new path.line object, and to do that it needs a start point, which is this first parameter here to the path.line constructor, and I need a two point or a final point, and that's just another point. So we call new point and give it the values X, Y, and then also new point X plus distance Y. So this will be drawing basically a horizontal line, let's say we're at zero, zero, then this would draw to uh, what is it? Zero plus distance, also zero. And let's go ahead and grab some sort of index so we can set the color. So we'll use get random index of colors dot length, and we'll set the stroke color on line one to a new color. That's the color of our index. And we'll do the same thing with line two, but this time, rather than saying X plus distance, we're gonna say Y plus distance to draw a vertical line. And we'll set the stroke on that to the same color. If I save, Actually, up here, I'm gonna comment out our dots and I'm going to call grid of x, y, distance. Save that, come back in here and refresh, and we've got a really ugly grid. But the colors are kinda of cool. If I wanted to get rid of those colors like I do want to do, uh, let's just go ahead and get rid of this R index and we're just gonna say this is gonna be white. Oops, not dollar sign. Save, come back, and now we have a white grid. 
So if we want to make lines that are even more fun, let's make them diagonal. To do that, we'll declare a function called lines and like our grid and our dots functions, we'll pass that our x value, our y value, and the distance. And let's make a new random variable called r, just math.random. So this is going to be between 0 and 1. We'll include decimal numbers. And then we'll get our r index so that we can get fancy colors as well. And I'm going to say if r is less than 0 0.5, so we're doing a 50-50 chance here, kind of like a coin toss, else we're going to do something else. And let's define our top left to bottom right line. And we'll define in the else block our bottom left to top right line. And so we're just saying like, hey, there's a 50-50 chance we draw a line from the top left to the bottom right, and there's a 50-50 chance we draw from the bottom left to the top right. So we'll say instantiate a new path.line instance, and we need the from point, which is point of xy, and the to point, which we're going to say x plus distance, y plus distance, so this is top left to bottom right again. And we'll define a stroke color on that line, which is just like we've been doing, a color of our colors index, and we'll set the stroke width to 1. You could change that to something else if you'd like. And we'll define line 2, which is an, another path.line. But this time, since we're going from the bottom left, we're going to go from x and y plus distance to a new point of x plus distance and y. Let's set the color on that stroke, and we'll set the width, and I will save that. And then I also need to call it up here. So we'll comment out our grid, and we will paste lines and give it the variables that it wants. Save, come back here, and refresh. And now we've got this cool kind of maze like diagonal structure. I think the colors look ugly again, so let's make the white. Just copy this. Paste that, save, and refresh. And now we've got this kind of cool little pattern that we have going on. There's endless possibilities with Paper.js and all these patterns you could use. I'll make some more videos on more complex patterns, but I just wanted to get you started in Webflow with Paper.js. If that helped, Please like the video and subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for more cool tutorials. All right, talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah.